All righty, folks, this is a session that I just could not miss. Yes, we got some family stuff going on today, so I'm actually down in Southern California. But I'd be remiss if we didn't get into your questions, your comments that Mr. Millennial Mike thought were the most important this week. So, Mike, thank you so much. As always, happy to be here, happy to do this segment. And yeah, you're right. What I do is I scour through the comment section of your videos and I look for good questions. I look for interesting topics. And I also look for the haters, a little bit of spice. I want to make sure that people who are frustrated with what you have to say get their chance uh, to expose you. And we're going to start right out the gate with uh, Ben Fox 383 who says, you need to apologize to Patrick Bet David. Remember when you guys were clowning on PBD about 10% mortgages? All right, Mike, you were wrong. They're up there. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Uh, Patrick Bet David did have a video calling out 10% mortgages. Uh, we do have 10% mortgages for low down payment, poor credit. So uh, shout out Patrick Bet David for calling that. But let's be clear. He was calling for the average mortgage rate to be 10%. It is still today 7.7. So, you know, let's not get it twisted. But hey, if you want to hear me say, I'm sorry I was wrong, so be it. I'm sorry I was wrong. I'm a big boy. I can take it. Uh, I always think it's funny. I think it's funny, but uh, that's okay. He, Patrick, you were right. I was wrong. Feel better? Hope so. <laughs> well, hopefully Ben Fox appreciates that. Yeah. But why don't we exactly. stay on the topic of... Uh, 10% mortgages and even just high mortgages in general, these, these eight, nine, 10% mortgages. Patrick Bet David did say he thought they would actually go a lot higher. But the question that I have is, do you think that these high interest rates will finally break the housing market? Well, you got to be very careful, right? I think these high mortgage rates are going to break the housing market. I think we are going to have a lower low in transactions. The current low is 4.02 million. I think we're going to go as low as 3.8. That's another 5 to 7% lower, but it's transactions. And most people want to talk price. So at least in the short term, between now and call it the spring selling season, prices are going to be flat. Uh, we will see what happens in the spring if, if we have mortgage rates over 9%. If we have an unemployment rate over five or six percent, we might start to see some price degradation, but it is not in the immediate future. It's possible, but you know, everybody wants a price crash, everybody wants a repeat of the last one, and it's it's not coming. That said, if you're in the real estate industry, you're in escrow and title and all of that, it, it's gonna feel like a depression. Oh yeah, those those guys are getting killed. Deals are not happening right now. I'm getting emails back from title companies way faster than I used to. They got nothing going on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so let's transition to a different topic. And this one right here is when it comes to buying rentals. You're known as the guy who's great at deal analysis. So this one comes from Guy Zimmerman. He says, Mike, you always say make sure deals cash flow day one. Do you bake in the leasing agent's fees? Typically, the agent takes that first month as a commission. So first month's rent is always going to be negative. So I'm wondering if there's an alternative to using a leasing agent, or is there something else that you bake into the analysis? Well, there are certainly other options. I mean, I think yourself, Dion, there's lots of people that you know use things like Hemlane or other self-management tools. So you don't have to use a leasing agent. But the answer to the question is, if you want to use it, blend it out over time. You know, if it's a twelve hundred dollar fee, that would be a hundred bucks a month. I I would blend it over the year, as opposed to a single month. But yeah, I mean, in my calculation, I use property management. So when I started, that was ten percent. Now, you know, many years later, it's less than that given unit count. But I include all the things, all the costs, all the hard costs that I have to incur are are included. Absolutely. Okay, uh, so this is another one. You were you were doing a video where you were talking about a lot of the actual numbers that go into what's happening with interest rates and why supply is constrained and how unless supply gets freed up, it's going to be tough to see a crash materialize. And I'm not going to lie, this guy got you really good, Zuber. So this is from <laughs> HHHH9321. He says, what happens to all your numbers and facts and whatever else you argue if war breaks out? Yeah, Zuber. You're wrong. Yeah, you know, if we have war, 
nuclear war, aliens invade. Uh, I don't know. We find a way to shelter ourselves without homes. Sure. You know, you got me. I mean, I don't know what to say. to. I don't know what to say to nonsense like that. Your response was, what happens to everything if war breaks out? Oh, that- there you go. That oh. was better. <laughs> that, that was better. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. I'm witty in my comments. Uh, yeah. Oh, well. It's a little hard to reflect the potential possibility of World War III in the data. But you know what? Fair point. If it happens, things will probably crash or who knows. So. I can tell you this. Things will crash and I'll be buying, but that's okay. <laughs> All right. So here's a question about BlackRock. So this one comes from Self Note 2075. He says, do you think there is a chance that BlackRock might sell some of the holdings they have and just put it into a treasury bill? And if so, would that increase the inventory meaningfully? Thanks for all that you do. So a couple of things I want to pivot on this one. So I've done some research on this. It is my belief that BlackRock owns no single family homes. I believe they're referring to Blackstone. So I just want to make sure the name is right because there are two companies so blackstone does own a lot of single family homes so if we replace blackrock with blackstone um it is certainly possible uh i you know the institute there's a lot of talk about the institutional buyer whether it's blackstone american homes for rent invitation homes the list goes on and on they're actually net sellers today that probably catches a lot of people by surprise So they're net sellers today. What does that mean? That means they're selling more homes than they're buying. So I ask you, is homes crashing? They're already net sellers. Now, let's put some numbers around it. I believe in the last quarter, they sold 600 and they bought 400. So they're net sellers of 200. So it's not a huge number. But nonetheless, they are net sellers. Um, I think you really have to look at their financing structure. I believe most of these single family homes are actually packaged up in a big REIT or they're not individually owned. So it's not like you can sell one off pretty easily. I suspect most institutional buyers, if they want to sell in mass, will sell to other institutional buyers. How can I say that? Look at our friend, billionaire Barry. He needed to raise cash. He owned 2000 single family homes. Did he list each home individually? Of course not. He needed cash quick. So he likely called up three or four big funds, ended up doing a deal with Invitation Homes and sold all of them in one whack. So for the people that are hoping that institutional buyers are suddenly going to unload in mass to individual homeowners, I find it very, very unlikely. I don't blame people for being hopeful. Everybody wants to see inventory be supplemented so that hopefully prices can come yeah. down but unfortunately not likely to happen at least from that avenue mm-hmm. all right so a couple of weeks ago you had daniel Martino booth and melody right on your channel i recommend people go watch those interviews they did really really well on youtube and they were great interviews um but people were talking about the fact that they were kind of female crash bros but we can't call them crash yeah. bros they're ladies so we asked a question in our last video where we said all right down in the comment section come up with the best nicknames for the female crash bros. So I have here for you the top names and we're gonna have you pick your favorite to refer to them for all time and eternity. So we have Crash Sisters, Crash Broads, Downturn Divas, Crisis Queens, Crash Bunnies, and the Crashleys. Now for me, it sounded like we were naming 80s female punk bands. So I added uh, four non bowls and we'll see if that one, uh, whatever you like best. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to stay as PC as I can. And I think Crash Sisters kind of makes the most sense. Crash yeah, Bros. I, I think the other, yeah, I think, I think that's okay. Um, I think some of the others are hilarious. But to stay on task, I think Crash Sisters just feels, it feels right. Sounds good. So we've got the Crash Bros. And from here on out, the Crash Sisters. <laughs> All right. Now, here's a great question, and actually one that I apparently was operating under the wrong information. This question came from, I'm sorry if I don't say this right, Powell Wisniewski, 6849. And he says, are Section 8 payments affected by government shutdowns? So I have been through a couple of government shutdowns having Section 8 tenants, and none of my payments were affected. That said, if you were looking for increases or other things, 
those could be slowed down drastically, but the payments never stopped. So now, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, I, I can't quite remember. I remember we had a government shutdown a couple of years ago. It was in the last few years. It was a major political issue at the time. I can't remember how long it was shut down for, but did they pause or freeze Social Security? I don't think so. I don't know for sure. And it was under Trump. We had, I think it was like a 35 day shutdown. Um, I don't remember. <laughs> I do know that the government wasn't paid, right? Uh, right. If you were in service, you were not paid, but right. I do not know about social security. Interesting. Yeah. So I was operating under the assumption that section eight payments would not go out if the government shut down. It's good to hear that they will, but I was already like, okay, well, I've got multiple section eight, you know, rentals. I obviously have my cash reserves and I might have to make payments out of that while who knows what happens, but apparently I was wrong about that. Okay. Uh, you Zuber, are abusing your real estate agents. So this question comes from Eric Gutierrez, 4960. He says, question. He says, so you have a real estate agent who works for you. You submit a hundred offers and only about one of them gets accepted. Would most real estate agents be okay with doing this much work? Or are you just not using a real estate agent or are you just abusing them? I added the last part. So first I want to say is I hope I don't abuse anybody on my network. Uh, I will say when I wrote 100 offers in 2021, I was using I was using Scott. Uh, Scott was one of my agents probably for half of those. He had a template. He could do a Mike Zuber offer in less than two minutes. It was always address, APN, and price. Everything else stayed the same. Mm -hmm. He was happy to do it. He was a brand new agent looking to make his bones. We did do a couple of deals together, so he got paid. The other 50, I was going to the listing agent. Mm -hmm. I am not an agent. I have no interest in being an agent. My job is to find deals. And in 2021, that meant write a lot of offers and not in, I didn't get a lot of counters. Um, you know, if, if your agent doesn't want to do it, find a new one. There are lots out there and they're starving and you really can write an offer in very, very, very quick fashion. If you know what you're doing. You know, I think the going to the listing agent is an underrated approach that people should take. Uh, I've been telling people for a while now, because of the out-of-state investing advice that I give, people who don't live in a market, they're not familiar with it, I tell them you need to talk to more agents. Don't work with one agent. Anytime you see a listing you like, call that listing agent directly. This is going to force you to talk to three to five new people a week. And over the course of six months, you're going to probably talk to 100 different agents. That builds out your network, gets your goals and, and ideas out there, and does nothing but help you in the long run. So I think that's an underrated well, approach. Perfect advice. All right. The very last question we have, this is a simple one for some people, but there's a lot of new people who are viewing your channel. You just hit 52 and a half thousand subscribers. Um, and some of the people are just now catching up to your content. So you're famous for saying you need to make a disrespectful offer. So Falcon Library asks, what is a disrespectful offer and why do you make them? So again, I think when I use that concept again, back to an earlier comment, I got that from Patrick Bet David. Full credit. I've given him credit endless amounts of times. He came up with that. And really what the idea is for me is I'm tracking days on market. I am trying to fish for motivated sellers. I know they're out there and I have evidence and proof they're out there. So most of my offers on on market or MLS based start at 30% below list price. I find that in most instances to be a disrespectful offer that probably gets a hell no the first time. The second time I make it, might get a counter or a follow-up. By the third time, if I got the seller communicating with me, I might have a deal. A disrespectful offer is not one the seller says yes to the first time. It's one that you follow up, you follow up, you follow up. Real estate investing is not easy. If the seller accepts your offer the first time, it wasn't low enough. I, you know what? I've heard you say that before. And there's nothing worse than getting your offer accepted the first time. <laughs> because then you sit there and say, crap, dang it, I just got taken. So the reason yes. you make that disrespectful offer is because we only do great deals on your channel. And to do a great deal oftentimes in this market means you've got to come in with a much lower price, a price that's so low that it's going to feel disrespectful <laughs> and they're going to ignore Absolutely. you. 
<laughs> yeah, they should ignore me the first time. I mean, that's the plan, right? I submit an offer. The agent loses their mind. The seller tells me to F off. I'm like, cool, great, awesome, good job. I'll call you in a week or two weeks and s submit the exact same offer. Maybe that time I get a counter. The third time I write that offer, you know, it's usually by the third time we figure out who is truly motivated, me or them. Right. Yep. And that's why I, th I, I think I watched a video with you and Dion just the other day. You said right now is the second best market to find motivated sellers. Maybe you can opine on that. Yeah. And I think I, so first off, it's absolutely true. But what do I mean by that? I believe great deals come from motivated sellers. I believe in most markets, motivated sellers are hard to find. This is the second easiest market to find motivated sellers. Dude, there's no transactions. There's no transactions. If you're yeah. a seller and you have to sell, you're going to respond. You're going to reply or counter to one of my disrespectful offers. And guess what? That's a signal that I've got one. Right. Yeah, it, it is remarkably, because again, everybody thinks it's hard. Everybody thinks it's impossible. Everybody's quitting. Nobody wants to do the work. It's it's not easy as people make it look online. And I'm like, great, go sit on the sidelines. I'll write some more offers and get some more deals. Yeah. The motivated seller is, is struggling very hard right now to maintain their poker face. And that means- <laughs> It's not happening. <laughs> it's not yeah it's not happening i'm, I'm gonna crack that poker face pretty easily i think <laughs> well mike those are all the questions that i have from the comment section to the people out there who are watching this if you have questions or if you have videos you want us to react to send them to me or leave a comment down below so that we can get mike's reaction to your questions and to your videos awesome buddy i appreciate it. i still can't believe you do this every week for us where can people find you uh just youtube or instagram millennial mike and that's where i'm at Awesome, buddy. Thank you so much. Thank you.